So today we're all privileged to get to hear a talk from Dr. Richard Grass, and he's going to talk to us today about archaeology at a 1700s Wichita village site that's located in north central Oklahoma. So I guess we'll get to it then. Okay. Um, uh, I work at the uh, University of Oklahoma with the Oklahoma Archaeological Survey, and uh, much of my job is doing research on prehistoric Native American and early historic sites in Oklahoma. And I've worked uh, over 30 years in Oklahoma and worked primarily on sites over the last 2,000 years that have been occupied the last 2,000 years, although I've worked on sites that are 12, 13,000 years old. But uh, today we're going to talk about one of the real late sites in terms of that I've worked on, and it's actually a site that was uh, in contact with French traders, but it's a Wichita village. One of the major groups and native groups in Oklahoma prehistorically is the Wichita. Uh, over much of, they occupied much of uh, Oklahoma and into Kansas and eventually into Texas. And then they still uh, live in Anadarko, so I work, uh, occasionally work with the tribe there in terms of their prehistoric and early historic sites. Uh, this is also the site I'm talking about, uh, going to talk about tonight. It's called the Bryson Paddock site, and there's another village near it called Deer Creek or Ferdinandina. And the, these sites were some of the earliest recorded in Oklahoma, and not only that, they're some of the first sites that had any archaeological investigation in Oklahoma. The first excavation at the site I'm going to talk about, Bryson Paddock, was 1926. A group out of the Historical Society was funded by then uh, Governor Marlin, uh, well, he wasn't governor at that time, but he was still in the oil industry, and he helped fund the excavations at Bryson Paddock in 1926. The site was again visited in the 1970s when they put in Kaw Lake, and the village we're talking about sits on the east, uh, west side of the Arkansas River overlooking uh, the upper end of Kaw Lake. It's actually still the riverbed now. Uh, and these villages uh, existed Sometime probably after the 1700 and the, they were abandoned by in the 1750s and the people we know historically moved down to the Red River where we can pick them up again and they're occupied the villages down there into the 1800s. <coughs> moved around after that quite a bit until they ended up in Anadarko today. Uh, so we can trace this group back quite extensively. In terms of the history in Oklahoma, in the 1541-42, Coronado comes into Oklahoma. He's one of the earliest European explorers that crosses into Oklahoma and goes up to the great bend of the Arkansas and Kansas and visited Wichita tribes up there. Uh, after that, there's another Spaniard that comes in and goes to Ark City. The sites we're talking about are listed as Ferdinandina on some of the earliest maps we have of the er area, but those maps were made in the 1780s. Uh, and then we have various French explorers with Lahart, one of the earliest ones that comes into Oklahoma from Nacogdoches Post in Louisiana. So this gives you a little background about it. Ferdinand Dina is actually a pair of villages, as I said, and they're both Wichita villages. And we're going to look at one of them. The other village, Deer Creek, has never been excavated and is now owned by the Corps of Engineers, and I'll show you a picture or two from there but it's uh, only about a mile and a half from the village we're looking at today. Uh, both of these villages have historic contact in terms of French traders. The French traders are coming up the Arkansas River from New Orleans, basically, trading with various Indian groups and eventually the Wichita in Oklahoma, and trading for hides, bison hides, meat, taking it down to New Orleans, and most of the hides are shipped over to Europe. Uh, and they appear in various products in France and across Europe. Uh, at the same time in France, there's uh, beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. They're using a lot of hides for belts on machines, but they're using hides for everything from floor coverings to wall coverings to uh, chairs, etc. So hides are in great demand. It happens to be a time also there's a, a, a bad disease among the cattle in Europe and had to slaughter a bunch of them, so the demand from uh, the New World for the bison hides increases dramatically in the 1700s. Between 1740s and 1750s, they're shipping probably hundreds of thousands of bison hides to Europe. So 
from not just Oklahoma, but from uh, North America. And we have some records on that, except they're not very good. The Harp met Wichita groups. These are going to Wichita in Kansas. He met Wichita groups near uh, Tulsa, modern day Tulsa. And this is the two villages we're gonna talk about uh, up on northern Oklahoma. And they moved down to south central Oklahoma in the 1750s. And we have documentations of these same groups down there up to uh, 1800s. Uh, in terms of the archaeological complexes, there's a lot of them in Oklahoma, but I just wanted to show you. Uh, we know of Indian, uh, Wichita Indian villages along the Arkansas and Kansas and in western Oklahoma that we know are Wichita, and many of the villages that predate going back a thousand years are predecessors to these Wichita groups. The Wichita Indians today are made up of various, what were various subgroups back in prehistory that were spread out over Oklahoma and western Kansas, and they formed the tribe we know today as the Wichita, but at, at times in the past they actually had conflict with each other, and then eventually with various other tribes. So they weren't one cohesive unit until probably in the 1600s. And just an idea of western Oklahoma, these are a few of the major sites that we know of that relate to the Wichita and Texas Panhandle, Oklahoma, and north central Oklahoma and southern Kansas that date from about 1600 to, to uh, into the 1700s. Again, the two sites we're talking about are up here. All the sites in red have some kind of evidence of fortification structures built by the Wichita Indians at this time period, and including sites in western Oklahoma and the Texas Panhandle that predate European contact. So there were building fortifications in the 1500s before Spanish or French got here. And we know that from the excavations and the radiocarbon dates we have. Uh, Ferdinandina appears actually on the 1860s map. Nobody knows where that name came from. Uh, some people attribute it to a Spanish or French royalty, but nobody knows what that means and why it appears on this map but it's roughly in the position for the two sites we uh, are gonna talk about as the earliest documentation of them. We do have historic records from this site. When the French came up the Arkansas River to these two villages, they traded with them, but they also wanted to trade with groups out west, and their main aim was to go to Santa Fe and trade with the Spanish and, and get a trade going back and forth. These Frenchmen that were coming up the Arkansas River are individual traders. They're not setting up posts up here. They're living among the Indians, collecting hides, helping them uh, process them, and then they're probably floating them down the Arkansas River in the spring when there's enough water in it to get them down to New Orleans and shipped out. Then they come up again with trade goods, trade with the Wichita. And they're trading with other groups to the east also, and then eventually to the west. Well, various uh, individual traders got up here and they used the alliances that the Wichita had with Comanche and other groups to the west and went out west to Santa Fe. And as soon as they got to Santa Fe, the Spanish were so paranoid about what the French were doing that they arrested the traders there, interviewed them extensively, took them down to Mexico City, interviewed them down there, and sent all this material and information over to Spain to tell the king what's going on. So we have those kind of records. Now they're not talking specifically about these villages and all that record, but it does tell about them here and there in those records. And we have these traders saying, we came up the Arkansas River, trade at two Indian villages on in the upper Arkansas, and then we crossed over to land through the Comanche to get here. And some of them mention fortifications at these two villages. Some of them mention how many people were at their villages. Some of the estimates are, that in one of these villages, there may have been 1,500 Wichita living in one of these villages. Now, earlier in time, these villages are much smaller. Probably a couple hundred would have been a big village earlier, and even smaller than that, when you get back 800 years, you get villages of 50 people, maybe, or less. Uh, and they're scattered along all the creeks in Oklahoma and uh, southern Kansas. So we have a coalescence of the Wichita and the big groups at this time period, and the descriptions are very brief. They become chiefdoms, there's head chiefs, 
And there tends to be two villages at a time. We have evidence further east of another two villages. We think that's for defensive purposes. They're fortifying the sites. They have enemies among the Osage and other Native American groups. There's a lot of movement of people after European contact and pushing people from the east into the plains, and it, it creates a lot of conflict. When you get the horse with the Spanish, when you get guns coming in from the French, that just increases your travel distance and your conflict. They're raiding the Spanish for horses in Santa Fe and they're trading out on the plains. The Wichita are probably the first plains group to get horses in the 1600s. After that, the horse spreads across the plains and it's traded up. Spanish wouldn't trade guns. French had no problem trading guns. They traded them all up there uh, along with other items. And we'll talk about some of the stuff we see as we go along. You can, if you have any questions, I don't mind asking as we go along, so. Uh, I mentioned the early excavation of the site. So we're talking about, we're actually visited in 1914 and 15 by uh, a historian from the Historical Society who later became president of the Oklahoma Historical Society. And the sites he visited were being collected by a collector from Kansas when this area was first opened up for settlement and broke and the land broke and he saw the sites come up in the plow zone then. And the interesting thing about these sites is about half of it's plowed and half of it's never been plowed. So some of the sites in excellent condition, which is very rare anywhere in Oklahoma, but in many areas. And as you can see, there were some large collections when they broke the site out. And many of it is historic gun parts and other pieces of trade items that were different from anything we see in most of Oklahoma. And we still have very few sites with this time period of in it. This is the first period in the early 1700s when the Wichita Indians actually had access to much trade goods from Europeans at all. So they're getting the trench trade goods. Guns, axes, hoes, metal kettles, that kind of thing, glass trade beads, cloth, and other things were traded, brought up the Arkansas for these. Besides the bison products, they're also getting horses from the Wichita and taking them back to New Orleans. Instead of shipping horses over from Europe, they soon realized they could trade for them here. The ones that were captured from the Spanish were bred on the plains and soon you had fairly large herds. In 1926, this is a picture of what they thought was happening at Deer Creek and Bryson Paddock. They thought the French were setting up a big fortified trading post, and the Indians were living in uh, earthen structures around the fortification. Well, this is a misconception. On the northern plains, French traders came in, set up trading posts, and Indians often settled around those trading posts in earthen structures. Well, on the southern plains, it's not quite as cold as the northern plains, and we don't have earthen structures for one thing. But the other thing is, these French traders were individual merchants or, or entrepreneurs, as it's found about, and they didn't establish trading posts. So there isn't any evidence of buildings like this at the site. The Wichita made grass thatch beehive shaped houses as the typical structure. I suspect that the French lived in those when they were at the site, and then they uh, came back periodically and lived inside them. There is a fortification that may have looked something like this at the Bryson Paddock site, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But it also stems from a native forts that were begun to be made before the Europeans, before the Spanish and French came into the area. So these are Wichita fortifications, primarily made for defense against native groups that are attacking them uh, during this period. This is a map looking down at the site, and all these little gray numbered circles here are where there were excavations in 1926. At this site was occupied for a number of years with maybe as much as 1,500 people in it. That's a lot of people, you have a lot of trash. They tended to build up trash mounds. So often these were places where houses had burned down or been deteriorated and they had a mound of trash to begin with and they just added to it and covered it with soil. In 1926, they came and excavated these low mounds on this site that were still visible, and uh, they were full of trash. They were full of artifacts because that's where people threw their trashes, and you get pieces of arrowhead pottery, all that kind of stuff in, in, in these mounds. But instead of being earthen lodges, they're trash middens. They're places where you bury your trash, like you 
If you go to Oklahoma City, you can see trash mountains next in parts of Oklahoma City now that we have. Same type of thing. But these mounds stand about two or three feet tall and cover areas anywhere from 25 to 40 feet in diameter. They excavated completely 11 of these and they made a map of it, but unfortunately in the historical site of records we still haven't been able to find the map. But you'll notice the fence lines here, there are two property owners on this site, they're half section lines. And so we can get an idea where, from their descriptions, where some of the mounds were roughly excavated. The black in here is where they excavated in 1975 before they put in Call Lake. This site actually sits on a high ridge above Call Lake, but it was soon to be partially bought by the Corps, but it never did get uh, purchased by the Corps, but they did do, do, do some excavations in 75 and four. So that in 19, oh, one other thing about the 26 excavations, it's not only one of the earliest excavations, but it's also the, one of the first excavations maybe in the U.S. where they actually used screens. Usually they dug and they didn't screen the material until the 50s and 60s when they, somebody had the idea. The guy that came up here decided he wasn't finding the small beads and stuff. It'd be a better idea to screen it, and they actually screened all the material they were excavating. Unfortunately, they didn't save anything except the really good artifacts. So we don't know very much. In other words, modern archaeological techniques weren't used. Here's an aerial photograph of the area. This site, this house sits on part of it, and you're actually looking at part of the site here. There's still some more of it. This is the ridge line, the bottom limb for the Arkansas. You're kind of looking southeast. The site covers this whole area here. It's probably close to 40 acres. It's a very large site. Excavations in 75 centered in this area and the mounds were scattered both in the plowed field and the wheat field. These two plowed fields have been plowed since the land was broken out in the 1890s. These pastures have never been plowed. Most of this since it's 1700s is a late period. Most of the occupation is in the plow zone in here. In here, so this is the area we see most of the artifacts that are still in place and we can relate their activity. There's a lot of features that are below the plow zone that we've been working on here. Our excavation started in 2003. We excavated into a trash mound here, some pits and stuff here, uh, tested a mound here, and then a lot of work has been done up in here because that's where we have evidence of fortification. And while I've got this aerial photo, right in here, in this unplowed area, there's a remnants of a ditch that when we tested it, was evidence that it was part of their fortification that had never been buried in because it's still an unplowed property. Both of, the, both of these are private landowners that we've got permission to excavate on there for the last six years. This is looking the opposite way. The edge of the bluff is about here. Again, you're looking at the house. There's now a house that sits over here on this property owner. Again, you're looking at the other field. Very large site. It extends from the section line all the way over to the bluff, from these trees almost uh, to where we're taking a picture of this, a very large area. Okay, the beehive-shaped houses of the Wichita. <coughs> they excavated one in 1975 when they were in that pasture, finding the post molds where the structure was, a little depression where it was, the central hearth. This site, this house from edge to edge is 40 feet in diameter. Very large structure. Most of the houses that are anywhere from 25 to 30 feet are the typical Wichita house. 40 feet would be a very large house. We also found these oval shaped structures which are probably arbors in Oklahoma. Usually your activities in the summer are going to be outside and the arbor is often, often associated with a house in Wichita uh, uh, structures. So that have a interior structure, beehive-like one for the winter, and right nearby would be an arbor. So we excavated one of each. Again, a very large structure. So large that they dug a, a pit here and put a post in it to construct this house, removed the post and put, put the central hearth in there after they uh, built the structure. So under the central hearth was a pit where they had put a construction post. Our excavations began in 2003 when the landowner who was living in this little trailer at the time wanted to build on the site and he knew about the site and he called us and asked if we wanted to look at where he was going to build. So 
Well, you can't tell it from here, but this trailer is where he wanted to build his house is sitting on one of the trash mounds. And I told you the trash mounds are full of trash. Well, that's many of the artifacts that you're going to find are going to be in there at the deeper deposit. And I said, uh, I don't think I can excavate very much of it. I can test it, but it'd take me a year to dig up a trash mound. He said, okay, well, I'll just move it further north. I didn't ask him to. I, he said, I said, great, <laughs> just move it off the mound. And when we begin to excavate that area, except for right near the mound, it had already been disturbed probably by an old oil well. So we hit it very lucky. Not only did he not care about moving his house, he volunteered to do it and put it off in an area that was disturbed. And he's now very protective of the site up there and we've been excavating on it since 2003, uh, trying to determine different things that are going on. We also got lucky in that in archeology span there's various techniques that have been developed. You can use electrical resistivity, um, you can use magnetics, you can use radar to see something about what's below ground before you dig. Texas happened to have a magnetometer, a magnetic thing, and the archaeologists volunteered to come up and do some survey of the site for us in the pasture that had never been disturbed before we continued excavations out there. And we opened up excavations to kind of confirm, well, it's going to go on its own, <laughs> confirm what we were getting out there. Uh, that was the start of it in 2004. It was easy to confirm that the Deposit is within about the first foot. Once you get below this line, this is subsoil that's never been disturbed unless the people that were there did dug the pit or something into it. So in the pasture, this is our undisturbed occupation and this is part of it, but below that is almost all sterile subsoil. So as you can see, when we, we expected to plow the field, most of your plowing will get this deep pretty easy to be disturbed. But there's a lot of information in plowed fields when you look for it. Here you can kind of get an idea. Here's the house after he's put it in. This is where his trailer sat. One of the mounds here, and there are actually another mound that go together. So there's two trash mounds there, which were, as we suspected, full of debris, including a very large grinding basin. I don't know why it's doing that. I'm not, I can't talk quite that fast. But <laughs> Um, so this is a, a grinding basin, uh, the basin that you use with a handstone to grind corn or other things like this. This is a very, very large limestone basin. In fact, uh, we couldn't get it out with two guys to get it out of that pit. It was in the bottom of a trash pit, of a pit that had been filled with trash and they threw the big grinding basin in the bottom of it. One of the main features we see is these pits that they're using for storage. They use underground storage pits. And those are one of the features that are gonna be still in the plowed field, but they're also in the pasture. There's actually a post hole in here, so this is probably associated with a house that was in the area at the time, near or under the trash bin. Uh, they lived here so long that tra houses were rebuilt or moved or new ones built, and eventually they burned down or deteriorated and, and many of those they built their trash mounds on. Uh, this pit uh, was within six meters of the current landowner's house, but we excavated most of that area. We found, uh, geez, <laughs> that, you just don't get to see those <laughs> pictures. I don't know if it's, it's trying to hurry me, I think. Uh, there's a hearth, fire hearth here, but actually it was built over a pet. And this is a bell-shaped pit. It's narrow at the top and expands out. The reason to make bell-shaped pits is you can close the, them up fairly easy with the narrow neck. But also, these people were hunting bison. And often, they'd leave these villages with very few people in them. You don't want somebody coming in and raiding your supplies if they do happen to come to the village. So many of these pits, which are outside houses, are covered over in disguise with narrow storage pits that can be sealed and covered over so you can't see them. And we have some ethnohistoric uh, evidence of this from historic tribes that they were building the same kind of pit. These can go down three or four feet and be three or three over three feet in diameter at the bottom. So you can store quite a bit of stuff in here. Mostly, probably food supplies in jars and, and hide containers, meat, things you can get out during the, the winter until your next crop or your Seasonal comes in. Occasionally, they'll find tools stored in them. 
Most frequently, they get spoiled and they throw trash in them because it's a convenient place to put trash and cover it easily over. So we find them full of trash, just like the trash mound. Uh, and this is a typical example. <laughs> and it went by. Uh, of, a, of a trash filled pit. They threw pieces of burned charcoal from hearths and ash from hearths. Then you get soil fills, some clay dumped in here, and then you can see the subsoil. This is about two and a half feet deep, so this pit was fairly deep. This is the one from a plowed field. Uh, but they're often dump sites for trash. And we find, as I mentioned, the post molds for harbor, harbors and houses. And we cut this one in half to see how, uh, if it was a post mold for sure, and it has that pointed design where they stuck in the posts. And then you can trace these out to see the shapes of the buildings they were making if you dig enough area. Artifacts. In terms of the artifacts, this period, as I mentioned, is when they're getting European goods, but they're still predominantly using their own native-made artifacts. So the tools they're making out are stone, bone, uh, wood, that kind of thing, clay. Uh, so we have pottery, we have arrow points, we have uh, scrapers and things like that. On top of that, you get the items that were traded in, metal items, handles for kettles and various other things. So I thought I'd show you some of the artifacts that we find at this site, which is a real interesting mix of native made artifacts that they're still, that they've been using for hundreds of years. And then you get the addition of tools that eventually replace the bow and arrow with the gun and other tools. Uh, the typical arrow point that you tip your arrows with is just a triangular, small, very small point. And uh, this is the point that we find stuck in bison bone, things like that. This would kill a bison. They were getting guns at this time they were getting black powder rifles predominantly. So they had to get black powder and musket lead balls, uh, which is hard to get. Uh, but predominantly they're hunting bison with the bow and arrow. Why would that be? Any idea? Instead of the guns. Hard to get ammunition a little bit, one reason, but there's another good reason. You ever tried to load a black powder rifle? So if you're on a horse and you shoot a bison, stop, get off, load it. Where's the bison? The rest of them. It's much more efficient to get that arrow point out and kill about five bison or whatever, and you've got it there. Also, you're saving your ammunition, uh, and warfare may have been a primary thing for defense and, and raising for these guns. So they're not using the guns for them. In fact, the metal is so valuable, most of the gun parts are taken apart for the metal after they get filed up. Okay, the other tools, these tools here are all hide scrapers. In the plowed fields, you can find hundreds of these. I'll bet thousands have been collected from the plowed fields. We probably have a thousand from our excavation. If you're digging at Bryson Paddock and you don't find a scraper, you're doing something wrong because they're everywhere. Why are they everywhere? Their main economic trade item is bison hides and they have to process those hides this is the tool they've used and they used for hundreds of years. It's not quite this big in earlier sites, but they're sitting on a chert or a flint source. They can make these real rapidly. Once they've done their processing, they threw them away and the next time they just made new ones. This actually works better than metal tools in which often have a tendency to puncture or, or damage the hides. The flint ones can be sharpened rapidly and not, or they're not too sharp to scrape into the hides and damage them when we're removing flesh or, and or fur from the hide. Um, so we have these by the thousands and they're really distinctive in that they're very large and crudely made because they're making them very rapidly from a source of church right there and just throwing them away on spot. So not only do we have the bison bone at the site, but we have these by the thousands that indicate that this is one of the main economic activities for this group. Bison hide processing for trade. These are fragments of pipes. Most of the pipes are clay pipes. This is just a piece of a bowl and happens to have a decoration on it. We also have a piece of a stone pipe here. And there's a red pipe stone from Minnesota that is traded all over the plains and other areas. And we have a little bit of that. It hasn't been sourced, but you can source it to make sure. But 
I'm fairly positive it's that trade item that's coming down from eventually from Minnesota. We do get some metal points made from uh, metal, copper, iron, and these are tinklers, which are what they're doing when they get the metal kettles. Instead of using them to cook in, they're taking that valuable metal and making other tools out of them, primarily decorative and noise tinklers are where you string them together and hang them on your clothing and they make a tinkling sound. Uh, and then metal uh, iron uh, handles for uh, pots. They're using the metal extensively because this is their first access, extensive access to metal. And for some tools, metal becomes much more dominant. Scrapers are good. The flint scrapers are good for hides. Knives, metal knives are much better. We almost see none of the flint knives. They've traded in metal knives. And I'll show you some of the other tools that are important. They're still making their native pottery. Here's some of the pipes that are made. They're elbow pipes. They're, smoke, they're growing and smoking tobacco, which they also trade with the French. Eventually, the French and English take it to the Caribbeans and grow it and trade it back to the native groups. But at this time, they're growing their own, and we actually have found the seeds, charred seeds of these plants at the site, among other plants. Uh, the big jars are the predominant vessel for cooking and storage, and then you get bowls that are decorated and stuff, and may actually be traded in from other Indian groups. Uh, there's an example of a pot. <laughs> it's fast. A pot from one of our excavations with the rim, the handle on it, and you actually have a piece of the base, and it would have stood about this tall, about this big in diameter. That's the typical size. They're generally smooth and undecorated for the cooking and storage pots, and and pretty basic <coughs> and typical of this area of the plain. We do get some decoration appearing on <coughs> pot shirts, and this has a little rim shirt decoration. We get some stamping on the pots, but it's very minimal at most of these sites. They happen to be tempered with shells, moss, crust moss, also shells of typical country. Here's some of the stone pipes that were found, and then again, another clay pipe. Clay pipes are real dominant, and that elbow shape is the predominant one. And uh, I don't have a good, I can't keep a good picture. <laughs> uh, figurines uh, up here are, are common at this time. This is the head of probably an animal with kind of ears here. I don't have a whole one. Most of them are real fragmented. So I get leg pieces and the things like that. But they're making probably horse figurines, people figurines. Uh, we don't really know what these are, if they're child's toys, if they're ceremonial, or if they have some significance, but they're real common in these collections at this time. Uh, down in the Red River site that these people moved to, horse figurines with sticks stuck in them uh, to hold the legs together and stuff have been found, and so they become even more common. There's the scrapers. We've done an extensive study on scrapers. Uh, and uh, in terms of how they're using them and why they're only shaping them so, so much. And it, it appears that exactly as I said, that they're really just utilitarian tools where they're not putting much effort into making the tool because it's so readily available material. Uh, the arrow points, as I mentioned, are all triangular, uh, small arrow points. And then we have arrow shaft abraders, which are basically the sandpaper. It's sandstone with a groove in it. And you put these two pieces, if you put your arrow shaft in it, and use that two pieces together to smooth your arrow shaft. So it makes great sandpaper uh, when you don't have any. And as I mentioned, metal knives replace the stone knives almost totally. We find almost none of these stone ones. The metal knives become real common at this time period usually fragmented because they're used uh, extensively. They would have had bone or handles. Some of them are replaced handles with bones from bison. These people weren't just hunting bison and trading. They also were villagers that for hundreds of years had been growing corn, beans, and squash, and they continued doing that. When Coronado and the other Spaniard, Oñate, went up into Kansas, they described fields of corn around the houses and that's the same thing we find here. We find charred corn cobs. We find the grinding tools, the hand tool in this case. We find charred beans. We haven't found squash, but there's historic record of them, and, and they usually don't get charred. 
and we found tobacco seeds. We find plum grape pits and seeds and some other wild plant seeds. So they're, they're an agricultural group and probably most of the women, uh, most of the labor is done by women in terms of the agricultural fields and processing. Also, hide processing was a woman's job, so I don't know what the men were doing besides <laughs> killing the body. <laughs> And it's, they're, they're very, they're a relatively small eight row to 12 row cob corn. You, we really find it very small today. Uh, their, their digging tools are still dominantly made of bone, bison bones, the typical tools. These are pieces of shoulder blades and uh, digging sticks. And this is deer jaw. The deer jaw, if you put a stick on this, you can see this polish on here. It makes a great sickle. And what do you sickle? You sickle that tall grass that you're building your house uh, roofs and sides on. So you get these deer jaw sickles, you get bison scapula hose for digging your gardens, digging sticks for planting your seeds. Um, the most dominant digging tool is this bison shoulder blade, and it has high polish on this end and a half of it on this stick on the other end. And you can see they split off the half here, put a stick in here. And they're all usually worn or broken from use in the soil. And I'll show you, they're not only using them in gardening, but they're probably using them in digging pits and fortification ditches. Bone antler for handle, for billets, for, make, for napping stone, um, all those kind of uses. Uh, we get bison ribs that are made in the handles because they have high polish on them. Uh, some of them are decorated. Uh, this is probably a rib handle fragment that's been decorated. And then notice the scallops up there. That's probably used for uh, processing squash to take the flesh off the squash, the, the skin off the squash. And the, those little notches allow them to uh, scrape that without it getting blocked up so much. Anyway, the, uh, it looks like a, a digging tool, but it's probably a squash scraper and squash they could dry and make into pleated strands and they could carry that with their horses. And it was a common on the plains to carry squash, dried squash with you for long trips along with dried meat and pemmican and other things. So uh, we have all the typical processing. Now one interesting, there's a couple interesting things about this site. One is we have this huge village of 40 acres and admittedly we've only sampled a small part of it, but since between 1926, 1970s, in our 2000 excavations, nobody's found evidence of a burial at the site. Not one burial. That whole, those two huge plowed fields, nobody's reported burials plowed up. Wichita earlier groups tended to have villages with, a bur with cemeteries adjacent to them, including the Ark City and uh, upper, um, big upper bend of the Arkansas and other sites in Oklahoma. We don't know where the burials are in Oklahoma. There are none at this village. Now, there's large areas of it that we haven't tested extensively, not even with the magnetic. Uh, so they could be there, but it looks like they're burying somewhere separately from this village, or at least a little ways away, because I feel certain from the amount of work that's been done in the past years in the plowing in the plowed fields, we would have seen something. The other mystery is we know from historic records that they're using horses they're, they have to get that amount of bison hides and stuff. Almost, you almost have to be able to transport a lot of bison hides and meat. And you probably have to go some distance from your village typically to get bison. Um, these two bones are the only horse bone ever recovered from the site. They were from that 1926 excavation which uh, dug all those mounds, trash field mounds. And these were kept because they're tools. They're used probably leather punches to make when you're sewing up hides or whatever. And so they're polished. But it's actually the metacarpal metatarsal of a horse, fourth metatarsal of a horse. And it's actually this shape. It has a point to it. So in 19, so we went through the 1926 stuff that they kept. The, those are the only two poems. The 1974 and 75, all of our 2003 to 2009 excavations, no horse bone. Got lots of bison bone, deer, some fish, some birds. Uh, they're, they're eating a lot of variety of stuff. Uh, they have horses there. What they're doing with them or where they're dying, I don't know, but they're not showing up at the site. So that's the two, two of the mysteries we've got at the site where 
where all these people were buried at, if there's 1,500 people there, and where are the horses at? Where did they end up at? Okay, those are uh, the native stuff. The guns are typically ornaments that were on guns, uh, gun barrels, uh, trigger mechanisms. That's what preserves in the archaeological records. We don't find the whole gun with the wood stock and stuff. It doesn't preserve, the wood doesn't preserve, but also, the, as I mentioned, they're tearing these guns apart for the metal when they become fouled up. Uh, these are some of the butt plates, raw uh, other parts, are mostly decorative parts on the guns that are stuck on the guns. Some of these are modified. Some of these are used as scraping tools and stuff like that, but many of them are so modified that you can't tell what they were doing with them when they're in small pieces. This is the sum total of, uh, of gun barrels from this site. And actually, there's a few from the other village from the, found in the surface. Mo all of these, the ends of them have been smashed down and they're using them for wedges or prying or something. Again, the iron in these guns is so different and, and from the bone or the, and wood tools that they have that they're using them for implements Many of them probably for wedges and some kind of prying because they're really flattened on the ends. There's, very, there's only been one gun barrel which wasn't flattened that I know of. The other thing that flintlock guns is you get the flints that are used to spark the black powder. These are gun flints. Uh, you get a few that are made from French flint that's brought over with the French. 95% or higher of the gun flints we find are native made. They're making their own gun flints, but the Wichita aren't making them. So how do I know they're not making their own gun flints? All of this material that the gun flints are made out of is not from this area. It's not the chert and flint that's in this area. It's somewhere else, and most of it's found to the east. I think the French are bringing in guns, and then they quit bringing in French flints for the guns because they can make a trade with the native groups to make gun flints. So the Osage, the Quapaw, whoever's to the east is probably making gun flints for the French for trade. And then those are getting traded with their guns further west to the Wichita. So it's interesting. Almost all of them, every tool we may have made out of stone except gun flints is made from the local flint and those aren't. So it's really interesting. We do have a few that are European. And here's one found in a trash pit that went by. But uh, this one is, as we found it, among some bone and other debris. And there's, an, again, another sample of them. Uh, again, the variety of chert is a lot different. Axes. Uh, we get axes and hoes. Uh, uh, not very many, and I suspect if you're carrying up trade items from New Orleans up the Arkansas River to north central Oklahoma, you're going to have guns which are really valuable. You get horses and lots of hides for a gun. You can get stuff for an axe, but not as much as a gun, and it's heavy, maybe, and the hose are heavy, so we're getting very few of those brought up. The other thing is some metal detectors have got to the plowed fields, and they may have taken some of these, but there still were probably very few of these heavy items brought up. So they're still uh, tending to make their own axes and hoes out of flint. I mentioned the kettles. We have some kettle fragments, but almost all, this is the biggest piece we have from the site. And most of them are made into other tools. In fact, I think they're extensively using their own pottery and using the metal from these trade kettles for something else. Another thing you may not think about, but one of the major trade items were scissors. If you think about it, native groups had nothing like a scissors, and this became a popular trade item in the 1700s, and they're not hard to bring up, so we get fragments of scissors. Sometimes you can get pieces of them, they call them knives, but they're often you can tell the blade's uh, part of a scissor. And these are some that were in the historical society from the earlier excavation. So it's an interesting trade item. We get metal awls, although we have plenty of bone awls and uh, another scissor fragment, but I don't know what the key's for, but you can speculate some uh, Frenchman brought up a nice chest of beads or something and locked it up and lost the key eventually, but he probably was irritated. But uh, The neat thing about this site is 
The homestead for one landowner is at the other end of the field away from the site. The original homestead at the other landowner is at the other end of the field. Neither of those homesteads are on this site. The occupation for the Wichita, so there's no late, except real recent stuff that, that typically mess up our collection. So it's all 1700 stuff or 2000 stuff. Uh, these are the tinklers I was talking about, and we actually think they're manufacturing it up to the site. After a while, the French were actually making tinklers and trading them in. At this time, they're making the natives are making their own pie out of the kettles. If you get the free form, uh, this one was broken, so they probably didn't roll it. They're rolled into these tinkling cones that they use on clothing. And these were quite popular because we find them all over the site. Uh, bells, not real common, but we get uh, bell fragments uh, at the site. Later in time, they become even more common at later sites. Some of the beads, but I've got another. Yeah, most of the beads we find are very small, and they're made out of glass. They're made in, in Europe in three or four different places, Amsterdam, Venice, a couple other big glass bead making places. And you can actually trace types of beads to Europeans and you can trace styles of beads. And I'll give you an idea. There's a kind of the variety we get and they all fit into this early 1700s time period. Some of these are used a little later, some of them are used a little earlier, but they all overlap in this 1720, 1750 time period. And you can see there's green, smooth, but white, very small seeds are, are one of the mi minor, primary things we find at the site in terms of trade items. And we we're real lucky in that we find pieces of cloth occasionally. And the reason the cloth isn't deteriorated in this case is, you'll notice, I don't know if you can tell, but it has a green stain to it. And copper and brass were traded in here on uh, metal. And these obviously have some copper and the copper salts deteriorated on the cloth fabric and preserved these sections of it. This piece here is actually has two edges, so it's a kind of a belt or something. And we have several other pieces of other cloth. I, I haven't, there's some experts on French weaving and, and stuff, and I haven't had them examine these fragments yet, but it's definitely a piece of a belt or strap, and the other's a piece of cloth is the best I can say. But we know from the historic records they're trading in cloth and they probably had straps and other things to carry in wrap containers. Okay, Wife and Paddock, the Deer Creek up there. Uh, they were important sites. I mentioned fortifications at them. There's, there's a brief description in the Spanish that they had in de entrenchments with a stockade with posts stuck in the ground. That's all we got for Bryson Paddock and Deer Creek. When they go down to the Red River, in 1759, the village in Oklahoma was attacked by the Spanish. The reason is that Wichita, one of their main enemies, uh, traditional enemies, was the Apache. The Spanish were trying to bring the Apache into uh, missions near, uh, near uh, south of, uh, southwest Texas and near San Antonio. And the Spanish and their allies, the Comanche, who hated the Apache, were afraid that the Apache would get all the trade goods. They went down there and destroyed that mission that the Spanish were uh, trying to get the Apache into. So the Spanish came back to attack them. Well, when the Spanish got here, they found this great fortification with Comanche and other allies around it. And they were promptly repulsed and sent back on the run and left a couple cannons there that the, that the Wichita captured. And the Spanish typically didn't want to report that they'd lost to a native group to the king, so they, they said, we attacked this fort that the French built, <laughs> and there was a French flag flying in it, and so it was the French's fault, and that we couldn't get revenge on them. Well, that soon passed, and they made friends with them, and both French and Spanish traders would come to this site in the late 1700s, early 1800s, and there is some historic description of this site, and this is a reconstruction of this, what this might have looked like with the horse ramada, Wichita houses, and Comanche camps nearby. And of course the fortification, which is interesting, it has a stockade that goes down to a spring coming out of the terrace on the Red River. And one other thing that's not depicted on here, it describes 
interior features of the fortification and how it was made with the ditch and the pallet and the dirt piled up in the palisade, even how big the logs were and how they were placed in there. And one sentence says, inside the fortification there were subterranean structures where people and supplies went when they were under attack, were kept and people went when that weren't combatants went when there was attack. I mean, that's important for Bryson Paddock because we think we're excavating on that. Fortifications, this is the other site near Bryson Paddock, a mile and a half south, it's on the terrace. And can you see this ring here? This has never been plowed, this has been plowed. This is the sister village to Bryson Paddock with the fortification still intact and a trench that may have been palisaded going down to a spring on the creek in the Arkansas River. So we know there's a fortification at this site. This one's never been excavated. So we don't know any more than that. And there actually may be two ditches here on this side and what's been called a, uh, a uh, no, I forgot the term. Anyway, a little, uh, I'll think of it in a minute. On, on the fortification, there's a s extension on it. This is a ditch in the pasture at Bryson Paddock that looked like it was intact piece of the fortification. And we actually took remote sensing over that ditch and other parts of it with the magnetics. And we thought we had, this is where you can see the ditch and it makes a nice right angle turn into a natural draw. And it probably came around here, we thought. And we tested up here and in this field when we had magnetics, we saw something else that might be a ditch. So we put two excavations in there and sure enough, they're ditch-like features. And of course, we tested across the one in the pasture to make sure what that is. And they all appear to be ditches. Then we cored, uh, which takes soil samples to look for more of these features. On the magnetics, uh, initial testing, all these colored ones on this one, except for the green, are features that are showing up on the magnetics, and mostly hearths and pits. But you can see what we thought we had a rectangular structure, some other kind of structure. We tested a number of these. There are no rectangular structures there. There are hearths and pits in there. Uh, this is what a magnetics of a mound, trash mound looks like. And this blue means there's a lot of activity going on there. And you'd expect that in a trash mound. We also thought we had a circular house, which I'm not gonna point out here because too much because it, we tested it and it wasn't. So magnetics have problems. But one thing they show up, see the ditch showed up real good. But of course, this is the one you can see in the wheat field, I mean the unplowed field. Now there may be another one out here and you can see other mounds. And I don't know if you can see this black spot in this mound. That's where they tested it in 1975. So it showed up that excavation really nice. And there's some other in there. So we went back and cored the ditch and cross-sectioned it. This is the ditch again. And this would have been the outside if it went around, and this would have been the inside, but there isn't much piled up dirt on the inside, so that's a problem. And here's the magnetics for the wheat field to the north. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. And then I thought that other one come up here, but you won't be able to see that very well. So there's what, and you cross-section one of them. Can you see that dark rims of soil that goes up? That's a cross-section. We took it and took a square through that upper trench, and there it is in profile. So there's a trench there. It's about three, we do it in meters, three meters, about nine, ten feet wide, and two and a half feet or three feet deep. So it's a nice trench. Good fortification trench right on that line where you can see on the magnetics. So that's that one. And now we tested these two, which we thought were on the same ditch. But notice there's lots of charcoal filled in here in the bottom of it, towards the bottom of it. And you can't see it in here, but there's post molds in there too. Strange thing to put in the fortification trench. We got to excavating, and this is the one in the pasture. There were three posts along it on the inside. Our idea then was they built a stockade 
from the bottom of the trench on the inside. Well, could be. Uh, piled the dirt behind it. Then we went to the pasture. I mean the wheat field to do that. Did some more magnetics and found when we excavated that, we found pieces of posts down in the bottom of that. And note, this is charred on the outside, but the inside has never been charred. It burned on the outside and preserved it enough to stay there until we excavated it. That's a piece of oak, by the way. But again, this is a post mold. In fact, this post mold is about 15 inches across in the edge of that trench. Again, this may have been on the inside. It's a really large one, Shane. There it is. So we excavated, we found actually a division here from a picture that's going this way and this way. It had three posts in it. We thought it had a heart. Well, that's another strange thing for a fortification ditch. Kept expanding excavations. There's no heart there. That was a burned floor. This had a structure Post done from the bottom of it down another two or three feet to put in substantially big posts and put a structure, a roof, over this two and a half, three foot deep trench. Strange. Again, no fortification trench is going to have a structure over it because you have a fortification ditch to keep horses and people from attacking you. But if you go back to the one on the Red River, inside the the fortification were subterranean structures lining the inside. Well, there, we have that another ditch up there. This may be one of those interior structures, and there's another one right next to it. So we have something strange going on here, but we have, in, in this case, the white is the ditch, and this is not outside of it. So we have one more. Let's see. We went back and looked at our magnetics over in this area. And you, can you see this line? Mm -hmm. That's a fortification ditch showing up on the magnetic. There's a line in here, and there's a line up here. Okay. That summer of 2008, last year, we excavated and it rained a lot. The farmer never got his wheat in. So we went out here. Again, here's this one good line. Here's another one, and actually you can't see it on here, but there's a third one here. We tested all of these in some other areas, and there are fortification ditches out there. In fact, there's three of them. Not, that is a, not the one. This is where we're excavating where all those posts were. You can see the edges of a ditch because here's the sterile soil in the wheat field. Here's where it's been dug below and it's filled with trash, so it's black soil, charcoal. When you get down to the bottom, it's burned. We didn't excavate to the bottom of most of these. We just wanted to see if there were trenches there. We probed to see how deep they were. And we went back to that area this year to find the edges, actually about 10 days ago, to find the north edges of that trench and see if we could find the west edges of that, what I think is one of those subterranean structures which has never been Doug, let alone describe her in detail. And lo and behold, our main finding was a hearth dug into the bottom of one of those burned trench floors. So you don't have hearths in, tr in fortification trenches and you don't have post mold. I'm very positive we have one of those the structures described by the French and Spanish at the Red River site up here in northern Oklahoma. We have our three trenches that we confirmed west of there so this would be inside them. We don't know where they all go. We tested this one, no post molds in it. This one would go down into the pasture. I think it goes up in here somewhere, but the magnetic's not really good. And it, who knows, but we've excavated now a larger area, more magnetics, one, two, three, four trenches, and the one we're working on, which is a structural trench, Again, we've confirmed these in excavations in a number of places. Not all of them are confirmed, but we have probed them. So not only did they dig one fortification ditch, they dug at least three and maybe four. All of these ditches were filled when they were still living there, and there are pits and hearths on top or dug into them. So maybe this fourth one is the last one. 
I can't tell you the order or if they were all open at the same time, but they were really fortifying the site. They were really determined to keep it fortified. And the trenches were filled in eventually with trash and soil erosion, and they built probably built more. Whether they were expanding the fort out or contracting it in or had them open at the same time, it's hard to say. It's hard to see why you would have more than one open. This is our final, I just drew this excavation plan up. We have the edge up here now, but it's still going west. This north one, we have edges, and that's where the hearth is. So there's another structure coming this way off of this one. It's in this area, which is not coming out very good on here, but there is a big magnetic anomaly in here. So it's unclear if it keeps going, how far it goes. So our excavations uh, 10 days ago gave us some edges, but it also opened up areas like, why do we have a Y-shaped structure with all these posts in it? and a hearth now on the bottom. <coughs> and at various places, it burned so hot, it burned the floor of this and almost made it into a clay floor, but it's accidental on that. It just baked the subsoil so hard that it's clay. So this was burned at some time, whether it was attacked and burned or they intentionally burned it. And then it was filled with soil and trash. They still lived at the site after that structure burned and filled that in. I can't tell you too much else about it, uh, the site, and that was the last slide, I thought I had another one, but uh, the site is, is so big that, and so complex, much more complex than we thought it was. We're still learning about Wichita archaeology. The historic things I told you is all we know from the historic record, just little teasers. My next idea is to go down to the site on the Red River where they moved to, because there is a fortification ring there, and look inside <coughs> of it and see if I can see what that interior structures look like. If they look like this, that's what I've got, what they were describing in the 1780s, 1800s. That's the one, the Wichita site we've been working on extensively, and you can see there's lots of archaeology. It's just the Wichita archaeology in the 16, 17, 1800s. Any questions? It's all as clear as mud, huh? <laughs> <coughs> was, yeah. The magnetics, um, the magnetometer, or um, uh, they read, every uh, soils have enough iron in them, especially in Oklahoma, that the iron aligns up north over time, or magnetic north. Well, when you dig soil and or burn soil, it realigns with the current, and if you burn it, it highly realigns the magnetics with the current. They're all lined up together, so that's easy. When you dig it, you disturb that, and those trenches were dug, and I know they were dug 300, but it takes 1,000 thousand or more years to get that magnetic back. So that shows up as the disturbed area, and not only that, the dirt they piled up on the other side, if you could see it in better detail than you can see on here, you could see that not only is there a ditch, but there's a place where the dirt had been piled up, and, and you can almost tell where the dirt had been, even though that field is plowed level. So that's really neat, and the pits are the same way. They've dug, not only they dug them out, but they filled them with organic soil that's all turned around. So it show, if you can do it fine enough, it'll show those pits that are three feet in diameter uh, and various scales. For the trenches, obviously we don't need it that much, but we need to recognize it when we're going across it. And those, that small part of the site, I still can do more magnetics and try and follow those trenches out in other areas. But even when you got one, like there was one faint one there that I thought might be one, and when I tested it, it wasn't there. So you have to make sure kind of with the archaeology what you're looking at. And so some of our archaeology is simply to see, is this magnetics really what a pit looks like at this site? And sure enough, it is. It's not what a house looks like, because those weren't houses. And so you have to do not just the magnetics, but once you figure out at a site something, I can go back to that magnetics of that wheat field and probably tell you there's pits here, 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 maybe a hearth here. Most of them are pits because you have to be below the plow zone to be preserved. And actually there are places where there are mounds still, enough of a mound still there, and that shows up too. And then there are other anomalies there that I haven't had a chance to test, but I don't know what they are. And the big, there's big black, you may have seen big black dots on there. Iron, <coughs> which is, is probably with guns and stuff, 
and it's highly magnetic and it shows up as a very big, and you have to almost <coughs> stick that out to see the other features. So, uh, you, can, you can do subsurface radar, and I haven't done it at this site, but that might be a good for the trenches because it tends to pick that up. And electrical resistivity and, and some other stuff. So the, the magnetics work real good at this site. And so we now have our own photon magnetometer that the dean bought us and I've been using on the site. So <laughs> we're real fortunate. And the students can now learn how to do it. So we're lucky in that respect. Yeah. So would each of the grass houses be occupied by just one family group or would there um, be many family groups? Historically, uh, especially at the Red River site, we have a little bit of documentation. There's, um, there's usually extended family groups or, or like you know two families or uh, two generations or something in a house. There is slight evidence that they had some communal structures and then chiefs had bigger houses. So whether that 40 foot house is a communal structure or a chief's house, it was not burned and so it was cleaned out before. So there's not artifacts there's hardly any artifacts in there to tell you if this was a prestigious person or a community area. Uh, when you get a burned house that's accidentally burned is when you get the best idea of what was going on in there because they haven't cleaned it out. Everything they clean out, they throw in one of those old pits or in the trench and, and you get artifacts out of there, but really where they are, what, what, when they're associated with a feature such as a house or something, you can tell activities and maybe prestige kids are showing up there or something. So, and then we have no burials, which give us an idea of prestige kids that were. Do we know how long they occupy a house? Is that something that's um, built? It varies, or? of course, but uh, most of those houses probably wouldn't have been occupied more than 10 years at that. And there is, uh, I didn't point it out, but there is evidence of like putting in new posts to reinforce or reconstruct walls, maybe rethatching them to extend their life. And of course they're grass and they can burn accidentally and they probably did at times. And what they usually did if they abandoned them is burn them down often, but not always, not many of them. Uh, that big one, one burned, and the other one, one burned. So uh, on, a, on a grass village, you may not want to burn too many houses down with other grass houses around it. But, uh, so you don't have room to burn them. The magnetics aren't showing you much either. So burn would show up pretty good, I think, on the magnetics. Yeah, the, there are several things going on that, um, that, that they probably moved. One of them is the French and Indian war, Wars in the 1750s cut off shipping, English cut off shipping of the French to New Orleans. So the trade goods were greatly reduced, if not cut off completely. Well, they did. the French did have a major trading post at Nacogdoches, Louisiana. If you move down the Red River, you're closer to a primary trading post. And there were other Wichita also in northern Texas at the time, other Wichita groups, so you're moving down there. The second major reason is the Osage were intensifying attacks onto the plains, and we know they were highly pressuring the, Os the Wichita. So many of the groups had already moved from northeastern Oklahoma down into Texas. These out in the Arkansas River in north central Oklahoma probably were one of the last groups that moved down, so they were getting more and more pressure from the Osage, which were now in northeastern Oklahoma and southeastern Missouri and hunting out along the plains. Even when they moved down there in the Red River, they got raided by the Osage. So, uh, it was not out of the reach, but it was a little further. And they had other Wichita and Comanche groups there that aided them. But the French actually helped uh, the, probably, they probably had a mixed, uh, mixed feeling about it. They would raid the Apache, but they could also trade with them. They would raid the Comanche and trade with them. Uh, and that, you know, it sounds strange, but it happened all the time. So then when the French came into the picture, they got the, the trade goods were so valued, they made a deal with the Comanche and Apache to be friends, and then they could get more, they could get hides from the Comanche to the Wichita to the French. Well, the, the, that, that uh, treaty or that friendship became even stronger, and, and so when they moved down the Red River, it was intensified. And both the Comanche and the, and the Wichita were enemies of the Apache. And that Comanche probably pushed the Apache out of that area of the plains uh, in the set early, late 1600s, early 1700s anyway. So they were in south, northwest Texas by then, probably the Apache, and then further south after that. 
Uh, remember, there's lots of movement around it after about 1500 or so. So those are probably the two key factors for moving south. You're losing your trade with the French because you're so far away from scarce trade goods. And the Osage are really put pressure on and may be reason building more and more defenses, I don't know. There is an interesting thing. There is one village that was attacked sometime, I can't remember the date, sometime in this period by the Osage and wiped out. They were suffering from a, a smallpox epidemic, but the Osage attacked, attacked them and burned the village and wiped it out, basically wiped it out. I don't think it was this village, but <coughs> it's real interesting when you have a burned structure like that. But I know it didn't burn accidentally because all, almost all the artifacts, when you do find them, are up in the fill. They're not at the floor or the post in the floor of that, in the hearth there and stuff. So that there wasn't very much in that structure when it burned. And trash was thrown above it. So. so is this the only part that has natural fortification from the uh, Himalayas? Uh, there's some slight evidence from the aerial photos that Deer Creek may have two ditches, but it's never been tested. There's a site on the Verdigris River in southeastern Kansas that is now destroyed, unfortunately. An oil uh, depot was built on it in the 1920s, and then it was leveled when they took it out. But there's some pictures and drawings that indicate maybe two ditches there, but again, it's not clear. And part of a palisade was still there at, at one time. Uh, but again, most of that site was even destroyed by then, so it's hard. And there's another village near, nearby there that's described by a Frenchman that visited it in 1720, 1719. And we don't know where that, they, they may know where that village is, but it hadn't been tested. Uh, and then the villages near Tulsa, we found one that uh, the Harp may have visited, or at least about that time period. And there is no indication on fortifications. It, it's now been destroyed by a, there's a paper plan on it. But there's some others in that area that, that maybe relate to it. Uh, but he never described a fortification at that site in 1719. So I, I think that the description of it, that may have been a small village at that <coughs> time where other people were coming in for a, a big, uh, maybe a fall rendezvous or something before going out hunting. And Lar Harp happened to hit them all there at that time, so it may not have been as big as that. Uh, but yes, that's and nobody has anything like three or four. There are villages on the northern plains of Mandan and some of those other villages which have three or four ditches in a pretty restricted area. All, all the occupation is inside them primarily, uh, but it's different down here. The, not everybody's living in the fort. I don't know how many people are living inside the fort. We know they're living outside of it also, so they just come in when they need to. But such a big village, uh, be you could get raids on it, but it'd be unlikely that you'd get a major attack, um, but you might, because that's a lot of people. But remember, these people are going out bison hunting, so large numbers of, the, especially the warriors, may be gone at that time. So we, we have pieces of information from historic descriptions later and we're trying to piece them back into earlier time periods, but nothing fits exactly. We've got one fortification ditch down described at Red River, and we've got three or four up here on the same people at one site. Anything else? Thank you. Let's give uh, Dr. announced that the museum will be open this evening until 8.30. If you'd like to come to the museum, you're certainly welcome to. It's on the second floor of Jesse Dunn.